So, um, yesterday I ended sleep sleeping and I had to cut the, um, the previous video. Um, <coughs> when I say yesterday, it's about today. Uh, crazy sleep cycles going on. But uh, we were talking about loop invariant and that's essentially what we are going to uh, start with uh, on this video. Uh, <coughs> and so I said, I think, that there, is, there was a relation between uh, these loop invariants uh, with mathematical induction. And, um, and so I think it is a good uh, idea to do a quick recap about what induction was. And um, why did I say that? So I said so because there is a, a base case that we call the initialization. This initialization initialization <coughs> is analogous to the base case of an inductive proof and, um, and this maintenance step is pretty much analogous to the um, to the and let's do a rather like that uh, the um, the inductive inductive step. So, um, what we, why is it relevant to us to talk about mathematical induction when we are talking about loop invariants? Um, the thing is, we want to prove how our loop is correct and our correction proof for the whole algorithm is not that different from the correction proof we have for the loops. We essentially are uh, showing that properties can be elected to show that for each step of the execution of our algorithm, we are maintaining a certain correction property, a certain desired effect in the underlying data structures of our algorithm. And that's pretty much how we do it uh, to ensure correction. And so having an analogy with mathematical induction on our um, key aspects of loop invariant um, is extremely useful because if we have this analogy we are most likely able to prove the correction by doing simple mathematical induction proof. And so with that in mind, with that thought in mind, um, what is uh, mathematical induction about? And once again, these series of videos are assuming some um, pre-requirements and one of them is mathematical for computer science. science. But I'm going to give an, an ordinary induction um, example uh, based on uh, MIT and I think this is um, Exactly, MIT 60432 um, <coughs> note. And here have in chapter 6.1 an example of ordinary in induction. And I think it's quite a simple example, maybe not the best example, but I think it's the most intuitive. And so, for a quick uh, recap on what and how uh, mathematical induction works, I think this is a good way. And so, this is essentially um, a different version of the domino um, example uh, in which you have uh, various domino pieces and you say if the first one uh, when it, uh, the first one falls and it uh, clashes with another one you have the effect of or at least when a, a force is, uh, is applied to the domino and it, it falls and if you have a series of dominoes and you do a small bit on one it is going to uh, send all the others down. Just a sec. Okay, so this example is probably easier to think about, uh, reason about, and it starts like this. <coughs> There's a professor who has a bag full of candies. And induction starts uh, starts by being defined in the world of philosophy, and it 
um, uh, but it is slightly different of the induction we have on, on mathematics. But the main idea is that if you have able to observe a certain property for a small set of data and it has the same characteristics of a larger one, then you may in this that the larger one is going to present the same uh, property. And in this case, we are actually using that when we invested in philosophy, we were doing a guess essentially. But in mathematics, what we are doing is a proof. And so here is how it goes. The professor uh, of a class has a bag full of candies and um, candy bars. And uh, this professor offers um, a candy to students in order. So she lines the students, all of them, and these students are going to receive a candy bar on the first come first serve basis. It has two, two rules. The student at the beginning of the line gets a candy bar. And this is rule number one. And I never I couldn't come up with a hardly presented cycle. Um, and the second rule is if a student gets the candy bar, then the following student in line also gets a candy bar. So if this student receives a candy bar, then this one, rule number two, also has to receive if when happen. <coughs> so let's come up with a simple hard hard drink. So if <coughs> student zero gets a candy bar then student when gets also gets one. And this goes on. Um, if student when gets then two also does and if two does and then three also does. Right? Well this mathematical um, in this sequence has a more mathematical description and that description goes like <clears throat> if student n gets a candy bar then student n plus 1 gets a candy bar. Sorry about this interrupt inter interruption, some noise going on on that side. Um, also gets a candy bar, all right? And this is true for every positive or it starts at zero, so non-negative integer n. Um, I don't recall the ISO exactly, but I think uh, we can say that n belongs to n zero. Yeah, I think that was the international standard representation um, but we will have to ensure. Now there is a thing uh, in the way they, they present ordinary induction in these notes and I'm going to show you um, if I'm able to. Let's see. Exactly. 
So you see here. That the perspective is um, a rule for ordinary induction. And um, and the principle the principle of induction is if P0 is true, and in our case it was, the first one would in fact receive a candy bar, then P hen implies P hen plus one for all non-negative integers n. Then P hen is true for all non-negative integers m. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, in our in our example. We have here the, the rule number one in which the student gets a candy bar. And, um, and we have ensured that if uh, the student zero was going to receive a candy bar, and you can say student, student zero receives a candy bar, well, then the definition of student hen is nothing more than um, a function uh, hen um, equals to um, true um, well you can say that it's a boolean function that returns either true or false and, um, and it starts with hen minus one and well, if you if you call f of one, it is going to be equals to the f of zero, and so it is. It will be a quick definition of um, a function that depends on base case zero, and it is going to reuse it, reuse it, reuse it until it gets here to the point we are in the line. For so for student number two, it is going to be equals to student number one. And student number one is equals to student number zero, and student number zero receives a candy bar, so it's true all the way up to n. Um, oh, and now I see I was writing, but it was not visible. Uh, what I wrote was student zero receives a candy bar, and uh, f of one equals f of zero, and f of one equals to f. Uh, Sorry, I wrote first f of n equals to f of n minus 1, and f of 1 uh, evaluates to f of 0, and f of 0 is equals to true. And so things work. Alright, so <clears throat> if you have learned logic, I think this is um, a nice thing. This is a, a deductive system. And you say p of zero verifies, and so for every hand belonging to hand, and I see that their hand here starts at zero, um, exactly. So for all of this, um, p of n implies p of n plus one, and therefore you can deduce that for every hand, every hand belonging to or in n, uh, you have p of n. So this is an induction rule. Anyway, this is not the focus of our uh, series of videos. What we want to do is um, analyze algorithms. And so we should go back to that. Um, all right, so here we are. This was just a, a rapid side note. It is not the focus of this videos, but it is in fact important to have a good notion of how induction works, um, since that's pretty much the principle we use here. Usually um, the, the demonstrations of induction are by, uh, done with numbers, so I really like this example because it abstracts the principle and, and puts it even more clo um, in a point that is even more relatable. Or, um, yeah, it's more relatable with the definition a person is more used to have from the philosophy and, um, and it even features the same uh, dangerous aspects like the bag could run out of candies uh, but this is a, a pure theoretical example and then the, the bag has infinitely many candies so the induction, induction works but it, is also, it also works as a kind reminder 
that we should not um, expect uh, our induction proofs to be necessarily correct because we are humans and we can be forgetting about uh, a certain aspect. In this case, we could be forgetting that the, candy, the bag of candies was not, are not infinitely many candies. And so, a proof is only as correct as um, the one writing it is able, and I'm talking about an inductive proof, or an, and even well, a lot of proofs, they are just as correct as uh, the human being writing it is able to catch all the necessary aspects. And so, in this example, and in this world in which uh, bags of candies are have infinitely many candies, and students are can be infinitely many and will have candy for all of them, um, it works. But sometimes in algorithms and when we implement things, we may forget about important aspects of the the of the universe of this program, the universe of the machine in which this program will run, and we may forget some um, important. Um, characteristics that will could invalidate our proofs. So inductive proofs are nice, but they are not the ones that enclose all the details and all the aspects uh, more necessarily. Um, and so we have to be very careful when we write them not to uh, lead us to think something is correct and has a proof when it doesn't. Okay. So, coming back to the initialization, maintenance and termination uh, aspects, I would like to say the following notes. Um, actually, that, let me check Carmen once again and ensure uh, we do not forget to talk about anything of importance. Alright, so Carmen has a proof. Let me put it over here. Carmen has a proof for insertion stuff. And I remember uh, yesterday saying that, um, and when I say yesterday, I, say, I mean, I actually mean in the previous video. I remember saying that insertion sort had two loops and we have to make a proof of each of them. We don't necessarily have to make a proof for each of them. We, we can uh, write, in fact, a proof for the inner loop and a proof for the outer loop. Uh, but what you really have to do here is to show that the underlying data structure and why isn't this writing? Um, close this and open it back again
what is delay and let's go back to our explanation so and um, we are saying that for for the initialization we have to uh, wait sorry when we are proving the correction of an algorithm what we want is essentially the form algorithms work with data and when you work with data you usually have some sort of underlying data structure and you have properties associated with that underlying data structure and um, and based on these and based on the properties of your algorithm you want to ensure and you want to show you want to be able to prove that uh, the operations you are doing under onto this underlying data structure are going to lead you to the intended end result that usually is either a new object of data or some in-place sizes on this underlying data structure so that's what we are trying to do and so do you remember we have done um, I think in maybe page 3 it doesn't have page 3 but it's maybe page 2 operation and so if we take this one and you go to here yeah, you see you can actually um, say that In the initialization, you have um, v zero, right? Before you enter in the loop, your your initialization say it tells you that, and and I, I actually should copy the algorithm. Um, yeah, so it was. The algorithm was this this and uh, this yeah it's not the best uh, um, illustration ever that it is going to work Oops. I'm actually going to erase that bit over there so we can oops so we can um, Okay, so now that we have this more polished, 
we can start our analysis. And so, essentially, and let me merge all of these in the same layer so I can write it. Uh, First of all, when you are doing a correction proof, you should enumerate the lines of your algorithm so you can refer to them easily. And so, our algorithm has line number, oops, line number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And for the initialization, it is important, and um, when you are doing this proof, you want to talk about J, which is the outer, outer uh, sorry, high, which is the outer uh, variable here, the outer iterator, and you say, hey, for the initialization. Um, high is going to be equals to 1 and we are saying that v of high of high is or actually the portion The array or V is okay, all right. The subarray V from zero all the way up to when excluded, which is high excluded, is sorted. This is the initialization. This is the property you can start with right now. And see, in a for loop, uh, you consider the initialization of the variable, but um, it's it, the prior being prior to the the the, the first iteration of the loop it is before executing executing all of this. Okay, so this is prior. To the first iteration of the loop, all right, all right. Uh, so this this is a property you are going to check for this loop at first. Now the maintenance of this property, and you can also say this is this happens in line when maintenance. For the maintenance, you can see the form. Oh, um, it consists of a single element. You should mention these things. Uh, it consists of a single element being trivially sorted. A single element is always sorted. Um, okay, so this is all you have to read, uh, write uh, for the initialization part. Now, about the maintenance. The maintenance, uh, you have to say that the loop invariant is kept at each iteration. And so, it's essentially where you explain the operations you are doing to your array near it, uh, to your line data structure, in our case it's an array. 
So, and I will write this in another color so as not to um, mix them. And you can say, um, you can say that the loop moves um, moves VJ You actually have to specify what the variable you are using is and um, why it is correct. And so, um, we, if unless we want to define who is J at this point, we have to use uh, the variable that we have already defined, which is Y. So, which is high here. So. Uh, let's rather use high. And so, who is j? j is i minus 1. So you can just write v of i minus 1. And it moves high minus 1, high minus 2, high minus 3, and so on. Uh, one position to the right. to the right until it finds it finds the proper position uh, now you see this is a very informal way of writing it, and um, but this is the description of lines uh, four to seven to six. Four to six. Actually, we are using J, so you have to include the definition of J, and um, that means we are talking about lines 3 to 6. So what we wrote here is, the, um, is 3 to 6 explained in words. And so it moves V high minus 1, V high minus 2, V high minus 3, one position to the right. Um, until it finds the proper position um, for v high and who is v high? v high is line 2 alright so that's what happens here now Sorry, but this is just the first part, right? Uh, now you have to say, um, no. mm. okay. Now you have to say that When it finds the, the proper position, we insert V high value there and 
this happens online. On line um, seven. Correct. And um, the survey. Because you also have to mention that um, your array or a certain portion of your super array of your array um, evidence a certain the certain characteristic you are looking for. Okay, so the super array. Let me think. Even V zero, all the way up to to um, to uh, high to high. At this point, at this point, and see. Remember, um, you want to show that the property remains true after the iteration. So you are iterating, and um, and this property it is going to remain true after the iteration. And uh, during the iteration, we were doing, we were, um, we were um, here, and we were working with v of uh, j uh, plus one, and we are attributing it to v j. Now, now um, we are uh, we have to create j. And, um, and well, uh, I think um, So, for each situation, you are going to move them to the right and decrease the the the, the loop. Um, yeah, I see that. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Uh, I was thinking about proving the inner loop now, and that was confusing me greatly. Um, uh, but no, we are, we are proving the outer loop. Uh, that's actually why we mentioned line 7, so otherwise it would not make sense at all to mention that line. Um, but we are, we are proving the, all the, the code. And, um, and we do this, this little, very informal proof of correction for line 3 to 6 here. And, um, and, uh, and that's uh, in a way, our proof of the inner loop, uh, and so we, we are cutting work with that. Um, so the super array v of zero to high, and that's after the um, after line seven, after line seven, um, and you see line seven uh, access j plus one, and j plus one is uh, high minus one plus one. So it is v high, and they say, "Hey, the super array from zero to high, j plus one, which is uh, uh, high minus one plus one, and the super array uh, v zero to high is going to be. Uh, it uh, it consists consists." Of the elements, elements originally, oh, originally in uh, V of um, of 
zero to J uh, to high. Sorry, I have Carmen here, and Carmen uses different variables, and uh, their array starts at one, Howard's array starts at zero, so I have to do um, the adaptation uh, in real time. Um, and also, I'm cutting parts and uh, changing others, so sometimes this happens. Um, but in V0 too high, but inserted harder. And we are talking about ascending. You see, you can say this, and um, you know it is true, because um, you have just moved, you have never erased uh, an element, so you still have the same element. Um, and then you finish this by saying that incrementing. Uh, Incrementing high um, for the next iteration iteration of the for loop reserves the loop invariant. Okay, so that's a, a very simple proof for this. Um, but if you want to make this formal, you have to make a proof of the loop invariant for the while loop. That is, you have to prove this. Uh, and honestly, this kind of proof I've just done would never be accepted on uh, an algorithms exam, or at least not in the ones I usually ha uh, I have to do to take. So you have to prove this loop, and I am leaving that as an exercise to the watcher. It is not an art exercise. Um, I've just been through. The, the proof in Corman, you can see it in more detail here. I think I have managed to explain it more or less properly. So there's that. Now, before we move on to uh, next things, uh, we have to... Because you see, we are relying on informal analysis and that's what Corman says in page 20 of my edition. We are relying on an informal analysis of the inner loop to prove our outer loop, and that you know, is not really acceptable. Um, okay, so for the termination, and you see, so far it was more or less like. Um, a mathematical induction proof. We said, hey, this is sorted and now we keep things sorted. It's the same principle, the same idea, but we want the algorithm to terminate, to finish. Otherwise it is not... Um, it is not... We usually say that it, uh, if it does not halt um, then it is not uh, computable, it is not intended, it is a problem, not a program. Uh, of, of course, in real world applications, and, uh, you sometimes have to do some while tools, um, so they are useful, um, and sometimes you do not want things to terminate. Um, in fact, for a really fast analogy, in Arduino we usually have a loop routine, and it is intended to keep looping. But um, for certain, in, in, in the, that's like uh, rerunning uh, some uh, algorithm. The algorithm terminates. Uh, it does not enter in a useless, uh, meaningless loop. For example, in that loop routine of Arduino, you would have eventually some global variables, or you are rerunning the same algorithm, but the algorithm itself, it finishes. 
and it asked if you have um, uh, a program that is intended to print uh, hello world uh, repeatedly what you are really doing is an algorithm that prints hello world and then you rerun that algorithm but the algorithm itself it finishes it prints hello world and terminates its work um, and when you have and that's um, now this is a really off topic but uh, there is a thing uh, named uh, hybrid uh, system and a hybrid system is, it consists of an auto automata that is described by um, differential equation on its states and it goes to other states that are also uh, represented by uh, a differential equation and what happens from uh, a state to another state is that just to clear this up is that uh, you have a condition here on this part of the um, of the edge and you have a reset here so you have a reset and a condition and what happens on this reset is to um, we are um, resetting our variables uh, our control input variables you remember a differential equation like this is something like a U, right? Uh, so you have a dynamics matrix here, and you have control, an input, input control uh, here, and um, and this is the derivative of the position. But uh, no matter that, what you are doing is resetting the variables that are going to be used on this on this uh, on this differential equation. So uh, for the same idea, you can say, hey as algorithm A terminated so that's your condition has terminated all right so your reset condition is either do nothing or uh, reuse the output and so you are doing a feedback or um, simply increment or do some operation on the variables but you are going to do the reset and go back to state hey now with new maybe maybe new values but what I want to tell you here is that the algorithm is the content of this state and um, and what you are really doing is using a, a machine that repeats it so it's um, it's not part of your algorithm. Okay, this is just a parallelism and a small uh, small notion I wanted to share. Just a sec. Hello, I'm sorry, I had to to leave for a moment, but here I am and let's finish. So we were at the termination and um, let's give, have a look at our code. Um, it's already a bit late, so I don't think I'll do the next video today. Um, let me see. So we are in page 6. And um, I think in page 4 maybe? No, uh, page 5 then. <coughs> yes, so in page 5 we have uh, just we order them here. Okay, so in page five, we have our code. Let me increase the zoom. So, uh, what's the termination? What uh, what's the termination? We are making a proof for this loop, proof of correction of this loop, and the termination of this loop happens. Well, this loop uh, terminates when um, when it reaches when high reaches uh, n minus 1 and well n minus 1 um, it, it ends um, when high is equals to n minus 1 let me just check something uh, da, da, da. yes so here it is uh, How did Kerman write this? Ah, okay. 
he wrote in another way. Oh, <laughs> weird. Okay. <coughs> but so it 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 stops when high is greater than n mi uh, minus one. So termination high is greater than and it was uh, greater or equal to n minus one. And um, with that in mind, with that, let me just silence this. Great. With that in mind, um, ah, hmm, let me just ensure something. Well, it can be tried it. Professor Stagiano, Professor Frank, how did it work? Write this. Yeah, he, he, he has it excluded. Carmen says. Ah, okay. Um, because the Carmen wrote um, that it, it was high greater than him. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's equivalent. Well, if hen is, um, for example, 42, just doing a, 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 a fast uh, sanity check, uh, if high is like 41, then 41 greater or equal than 42 minus 1 is equivalent to say 41 greater or equal to 41 which checks and high equals 41 greater than n that is 42 uh, and it doesn't check so it's not equivalent not equivalent. It's not equivalent. Hmm. What am I missing? arrays start at when and maybe just maybe hint at him
Yes. And looking at this code, in order to be correct, <coughs> we have to So, Carmen's uh, for loop is inclusive and the idea is it goes from a value to another value and it actually takes that other value, just a second. Okay. Um, and it actually takes, uh, what was I saying? Oh gosh. <sighs> it is a closed interval, it goes from value to another value and Carmen also has this interesting property that by the end of the loop the variable used in the loop uh, control structure is still available with um, the last increment or decrement after the loop, so that's a neat thing. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, ah, and the array on Carmen's doesn't start at zero, it starts at one, and it ends at n, which makes sense. Um, in, uh, in, a, in a way. But that's not how we are doing it here. I actually prefer to work with it starting at zero and having this. I mean, I understand that with uh, the common way we don't have the, the hassle of working how it with plus one, minus one, etc. But I think it, um, to, at least to me, it helps me reasoning about what I'm doing and uh, where am I. And maybe it's because I'm already used to this way uh, from working with uh, programming. Um, my professor also used to say that um, working with um, the index starting at one uh, makes um, the reasoning easier when we are making formal proofs. I honestly think it is more of a, f a matter of um, you. Uh, of habit and not really um, a technical fact. More of, I'm more used to working in a way or another way, but I think both ways have its advantages and disadvantages, and it's nice to work a bit with both and see what we like the most. Um, I think um, in doubt it makes sense to go with um, with the race starting at zero because that's the most common. So. It also has some technical advantages, and if I recall, uh, Professor Frank's notes, he does explain them. Uh, these technical advantages on his notes it has to do with the way um, memory works and uh, and how computer works. Um, even at the CPU level, we usually have a, a zero resistor, and so it's, it makes perfect sense to. Uh, do our comparisons with zero. I remember in uh, my algorithm, in the algorithms course I took, 
uh, that we had to implement uh, various graph structures and um, and um, one of the things we did at some point was to implement the um, a graph that uh, whose underlying structure was all implemented uh, with um, things starting at one and uh, that that had the advantage of um, making the input processing faster it was a very particular case very specific case um, and we are aware how is with the plus one in the complexity the spatial complexity uh, because the, the, there was a constant uh, item the, an n plus one element uh, in, in that plus one in the memory was osseous that is it, it, it was not being used so that was an implementation it was an interesting case um, hopefully we did not have to waste that uh, little bucket um, theoretically we were we could simplify and consider that plus one uh, a constant and therefore ignorable uh, it is not and um, that it always depends on the on the on the machine you are working on and the next video will be about uh, the random access machine model it is not the one I use when I did algorithms um, because we always had to define our own uh, models um, and it, 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 it had to do with the way uh, and the skills we wanted to develop I will probably use RAM for, for, the, for this series of videos it's a simple model, it makes sense um, but I will, I will uh, walk through a bit on um, the developing of your HAL model and how to operate on that and maybe talk a bit more about uh, formal models. But anyway, so for our case and for the pseudo code we are uh, working with that we have not defined and maybe we should have, but uh, maybe something to do in another video. Uh, for now, uh, we already know the, the, how the array, the array we are using works and this is our termination uh, condition. It's slightly different from Corman's, our code is also slightly different, so it's all okay. okay. And as long as we feel confident about our proof, it is probably right. Maybe it isn't. But I hopefully am doing things correctly here, so let's see. Um, continuing then with carbon a bit more longer and the termination. This is in page 20 of my book and shouldn't be too far from yours. For the termination, um, we have to examine what happens when the loop terminates. So when the loop terminates, this is the condition of, of loop termination, we have hi equals to n minus 1. And um, and yeah, um, and you, you can say that happens because you increment by 1. We increment as we increment with step equals 1 we increment high with step equals 1 uh, on each iteration ok and um, and now we have to say that um, remember what we were always uh, checking, even here. Um, we we are we were always saying that the subarray consists of the element originally in town, etc. And that's that's what happens. Uh, when there is maintenance of that characteristic, and um, the, the more the more important part here is that um, you have at this point uh, v from zero all the way up. To, and we have to formalize notation. I'm always changing notations here, and that can be confusing at some point. I mean, it's obvious what is being done, but maybe it's not as obvious as I think. So, har 
sorted in ascending order and all the elements were in the original array correct oh and I see that my face is cutting right off there um, so carbon says the same thing uh, it increased and um, uh, yeah you can replace m minus 1 with high and um, and so you say hey um, if we replace uh, actually yeah it's important to evidence and let me erase this I already did that you see this is I consciously did that you see this part here this is very important a very important step because you have to observe that the subarray you were working with um, in all of your proof and that you were ensuring it was all sorted now has the same dimension as of the original array and so if it has the same dimension that means how the original array is now sorted um, and so you can say hence the algorithm is correct. Um, my professor, uh, a professor I had uh, of uh, theoretical computer science, uh, formal models, computability, complexity, and things like this, um, he used to finish his proofs with the. And that's because um, a good proof has to look obvious, it has to make you feel like oh this was trivial and um, if you feel like that then the one who did the proof uh, it has, it is on its own right of saying the so the it's another way of doing the square but it's a funnier way so it's proved and uh, I don't really know how long this video was because I did a lot of interruptions. Oh, it says there. Okay, it's one hour video. So I think it's enough for this one. And in the next one, we are going to talk about the RAM model and the um, model of rhythms. And so, and maybe we talk, um, we do one other proof, um, maybe not. Uh, but the key uh, aspects of formal proofs uh, are these ones. This is how Corman does, with some additions uh, from the Professor Frank's notes that I think are really, really important and helpful. So I wanted to put their, uh, this there. Um, I really like the, the, the relation he does with Bertrand um, contracts. Uh, if you, you are able to put a bit of logical logic there, it, it is always better. Um, <coughs> it's a fun model, maybe we do have a series on video coming on Logix one day, maybe not, uh, but it's a really nice thing, SAT solvers, SMT, SMT solvers and things like these are also very neat and um, maybe we, do, we should have a video session on these, but no, I'm not predicting that anytime soon, unfortunately, or a priority for now. So that's it. Folks, um, until the next video.